I would like to consider with you the love of Jesus and the message that I have for you from the Word of God, from the New Testament and John's Gospel. And particularly in John's Gospel, I want to think of the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus, the love of God is a vast subject throughout the Bible. But if we try and confine what we have to say tonight to John's Gospel, and particularly in a reading from John chapter 13, we want to think of his love for his own and the way that John knew and experienced that love himself, which is very interesting, as he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, first of all in John 13 and throughout his Gospel. So I want to read a few verses in John chapter 13 and then we'll think about the love of Jesus. Verse 1 of John chapter 13, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. What a statement. He loved them unto the end. And then it goes on to tell us about the Lord Jesus washing the disciples' feet girding himself with a towel and washing their feet. And it says in verse 5 that after he had poured water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. An expression of love. In fact, in verse 1 of John chapter 13, another translation would tell us that he loved them unto the end. They translate it as... He then, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And there was a great expression of love in the Lord Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But further down the chapter, the other verse that we mentioned, in verse 23, John describes himself as one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And we do trust and pray that what we consider as we look at the Word of God, and John's Gospel in particular, it might be a blessing to you, as God's Word will be blessed if you take it in and understand it. As we have this subject before us, the love of Jesus, and the love of God even, we might say, well, what is the difference between the love of God and the love of Jesus? His Father in Heaven, the Son of God upon Earth, equal and who they are as God, the Lord Jesus, God manifest in flesh. You go to Romans chapter 8 and you'll understand there that there isn't really any difference between the love of God and the love of Christ, because nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is the love of Jesus? The love of Jesus, the man that was here in this world. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God manifest in flesh is the very fullest expression that we can ever appreciate and understand of the love of God. And here is a man upon earth. He was known as Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, he called himself even on the Damascus Road during Paul's conversion. He called himself Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus the Nazarene, that despised place of Nazareth where he grew up in. He called himself Jesus the Nazar, the Nazarene. So, what we want to look at is the love of Jesus. You think of John's Gospel and you think of love and the love of God, the love of Jesus. All you can think about, really, if you don't know much of the New Testament and you know a little about John's Gospel, is John chapter 3 and verse 16. And the world used to know this verse very well, particularly when I was younger. And before that, perhaps doesn't know it as well today, but that great verse tells us, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That very expression today, in the world that we live in today, is so up to date. For God so loved the world. There is no separate group upon earth. There is no ethnic group upon earth. There are no nations or peoples that God does not love because he loves the world and I often think of that when the Lord Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and what a shock that must have been to that man 
the man that was the teacher amongst the Pharisees, perhaps the teacher in Israel at that time, the one who everybody looked up to for an understanding of the word of God, of the Old Testament scriptures which were which they had in their hands in, in those days, and that he taught from, no doubt, himself so often, and he's standing before Jesus that night, and he's listening to him explain to him that he needs to be born again. And he's trying to sort of assimilate what the Lord is saying and perhaps getting a little embarrassed about it all and perhaps thinking that this young man is, is teaching me, the teacher in Israel, and he, he asked the question perhaps out of that kind of spirit of embarrassment and, and a lack of understanding. Can someone go into their mother's womb and be born again? What, what kind of teaching is this? But then when the Lord Jesus tells him that the heavenly things that he's come to reveal to Nicodemus are things, are things that perhaps he needs to understand above everything else. He really needs to understand above everything else. And contained in those heavenly things, this message from heaven is this, that God so loved the world. He's a Jew. Messiah has come for the Jews. And he's understanding that God loves the world. What an incredible revelation to that man that night. You know, that's, it, was, uh, it wasn't, amazingly, it wasn't so long ago that I really appreciated how much of a revelation that would have been to Nicodemus that night, that God loved the world, because he expected that God loved the Jews, he expected that God would love the Pharisees, the, the group that he was part of, he expected that God would love the temple and love all the things that were part of Israel, and that God would send Messiah to deliver the nation and set the nation prominent again amongst the rest of the world. But God had a greater plan. Even in the nation being in that place, he had a greater plan. And that greater plan, which would be revealed through the Lord Jesus, was that God loved the world. God loved the world. And what I want to tell you in the message is that that love of God for the world, for people in the world, for everyone was seen in the life of the Lord Jesus. I think that's what John felt within his own soul, that love of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus for himself. But he, he knew as he watched him and listened to him throughout his life and his ministry amongst men and women since the first day that he came to know him, that it was all infused with something that was unmistakable to him and to his disciples, and to those that knew him, and those that understood him. And that unmistakable thing was that he had a love for people. He really loved them. You know, in the very first chapter of John's Gospel, he tells us that he's the creator. He tells us that he's the light that's come into the world. And that light was the life of men. But he also tells us that he was a lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. In that very statement, we're understanding something of God's love for the world, and that the Lord Jesus was the Lamb of God. And then you move into chapter 2 of John's Gospel, and we're thinking, I'm thinking, I was thinking earlier on as I thought about how I would present this, that what I want to bring before us is something of the miracles and uh, the key moments in John's Gospel that perhaps revealed to us something of the love of Jesus. You see, the word love isn't used all the time. John doesn't explain everything that the Lord does that has a basis of love behind it in the chapters where he writes it, in the verses, that, the words that he writes down in his narrative throughout his gospel. But it's there for, to be understood and appreciated when you read into these occasions of the Lord's miracles and the words that he said. I always find the first miracle in Cana in chapter 2 is quite a, an amazing thing. But here's a miracle that the Lord Jesus did not need to do. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that he didn't have a plan to do something that day. He did. He knew himself what he would do. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that. The Word of God tells us about that in, on some occasions, that the Lord knew what he would do. And it's exactly the same in that first miracle in John chapter 2, that he knew. But, but he never had to perform a miracle that day. 
On other occasions throughout the Lord's life, when the disciples got to know him and he was faced with those that were ill and uh, needed to be healed, they expected the Lord to do something about it. They knew that it was almost as if, and it probably was just the case, that illness couldn't be in the ascendancy when Christ was in the presence of someone that needed healed. That he would heal them. His power was so great because of who he was as a son of God here amongst men. That he could heal and he could bless men and women in a way physically that no one else could. And he displayed that power in his miracles. And he displayed power over nature as he calmed the storm on the sea on other days as well. And on that day, he didn't need to do it. What would have happened if they run out of wine in the wedding in Cana? What would have happened? Well, the bridegroom, the master of ceremonies, the person responsible for making sure everything went well, might have been very embarrassed. Might have been in a difficult spot. Might have had to gather together the stewards or whoever they were to go around and try and find if they could buy more wine somewhere. Try and get their hands on it, wherever it was. The Lord did not need to do something. Why? Why did he do it? Why did he supply the wine that was lacking in that wedding? It's because he cared. Something we need to remember. That in the small circumstances of life. That you might not be able always to put a tag upon them. That require God to do something. Or the Lord to do something. Or you might not even think about asking him to do anything. He knows. And he cares. Even in the times where we might be embarrassed. In a situation. Where we might find ourselves in an awkward spot. The Lord is interested. And he cares. That, that surely is a sign of love. For someone to care in a situation. Where he's not responsible. And he doesn't need to do anything. And he doesn't want to do it for particularly for his own, his own glory or to make himself the subject of adulation by everybody because of the miracle. You, what, you, the Lord always wanted people to see past the miracles to get to who he truly was with the man that was ready to forgive their sins above everything else. Ready to bless them through what he said rather than, rather than the miracles that he did. And he manifested forth his glory on that first day. The glory of of a man that was willing to bless just because he cared in these circumstances. And that's a lo lovely thing to see. And as you move on through that gospel, and we've looked at John chapter 3, and you see the Lord Jesus telling Nicodemus that God so loved the world. And Nicodemus is listening to him. Of course, it made an impression upon this man, because this man then stood up for the Lord in the Sanhedrin, and he, 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 was, he was warning him against judging someone before, before they really knew him and heard him and so on. And he was the same man that with, Nick, that with Joseph of Arimathea took his body and wrapped it in the linen cloth and the ointments for burial. He was a man that came to appreciate who the Lord Jesus truly was because he listened to the message that the Lord told him on that day that he needed to be born again and that God loved the world, loved the world. He was a far bigger God than a God just for the Jew. And just for his chosen people, if you like. His design was for the whole world to be blessed by the Messiah. By the Christ. By the Lamb of God. And Nicodemus came to understand that. It's a wonderful thing to understand that. If you've never given it any thought before, I don't know who might be watching this. I don't know who might be listening to it. If you've never given it any thought before, I want to tell you that God truly loves you and he loves everybody and the world needs to hear that message today when there's so much fracture amongst ethnic groups and there are so many people that think they're of more value than other people and everyone's the same as far as God is concerned. He came to die upon a cross and to give his life that men and women like you and me might be saved. And regardless of the type of person we are, he loves us. He loves us. And that's exactly what John understood of the life of the Lord Jesus here. You see, because you move on from John chapter 3, after we understand that he is the saviour of the world, really, because God loves the world that he gave his son. 
move on to John chapter 4. And who's the first person that we read off there that comes into blessing from the Lord Jesus? It's somebody that's outside of Israel, outside of the Jews, outside of that people that the Jew was expecting Messiah to come for. He's an illustration of his love for the world as the Lord Jesus goes to a woman in Samaria. The disciples come back to this place where the Lord is at the well after they've gone to find food because they need to eat something. And the Lord is sitting in the well and he's thirsty. And this woman comes and he knows exactly her need. You maybe know this anyway. Do you want to know why that woman went to that town afterwards with her heart so full about the person that sat beside her on the well that day? It's because she knew in his words and his offer of living water to her that was genuine, she knew in her heart that the Messiah, the man that told her all things that ever she did, she knew in her heart that he loved her. That's why. She knew that he loved her. A Jew speaking to a Samaritan, it was unheard of. A Jew asking a Samaritan for anything was unheard of. He could be dying at the side of the road. He'd be reluctant to have a Samaritan do anything for him. And the Lord Jesus gives that woman a drink of living water, which welled up in her soul and brought to her eternal life because she believed in him. That's how she came into the blessing of it, by faith. But she knew that this man, this greatest of men that was ever walked on this earth, he was more than a mere man, the son of God. She knew that he loved her. That was the secret to it. And then you're thinking to yourself, well, if he's going out of his way to show his love for the world by reaching out to this woman that so much needed him and her sin, the next person that's blessed is a nobleman. He's a courtier. You see, God, God is no respecter of persons. What the Lord does for this man is he heals his son and this man, it would seem, had went out of his way to find the Lord Jesus. And after he'd found him, he asked him to heal his son. The Lord Jesus told him that his son lived. His son was back home. The man believed the word that Jesus said, went back home, found out. It was exactly the same time that the Lord spoke the words that his son was healed. He asked his servants when it was, it was exactly the same time. But the thing about that, really for us, about the love of Jesus is... is that his love reaches out to those who are in the higher classes of society as well, even though they don't want it. That's an incredible thing. When men get self-sufficient and full of their own importance, they think they don't need God, they don't need Christ, they don't need his love, and they can survive on their own. Their world's in a mess. So many people in the world today who think they don't need Christ and they can go on in their own way and they don't need the love of God or the love of Jesus. And I see the disciples with the Lord, and this is what's on my mind as I'm thinking of John's Gospel, the disciples with the Lord watching all this. John taking it all in, understanding what the Lord is doing, becoming having a fuller, and appreci a fuller appreciation of what it is until you get to chapter 13, and perhaps he describes himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved, particularly in chapter 13, because he spent that whole time with the Lord, and he's seen it all, and seen the way he's acted towards those that are around, and towards himself. You come into chapter 6, and what about the feeding of the 5,000? Oh, you say the Lord is maybe displaying his power. And giving them an opportunity to believe who he is. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But what was the primary reason why he fed them? It's because they were hungry. They needed bread. You know, when John's describing the miracles that are the same as the ones in the other Gospels, I think there's only two of them, which is the, the storm on the lake and the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6. When John's describing them, he gives you some details just to tell you the impossibility of this not being a miracle that can be attested to and testified to by everyone that was there, all the witnesses. 
He's really presented to us because John wants us to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. He wants us to have life through his name because we understand who he is and what he's able to do and his blessing for us in salvation because of who he is, the Son of God. So when he's telling us these seven signs or miracles, signs there are in John's Gospel, when he's, the signs weren't really part of my message tonight, but anyway, when he's telling us about, about these signs, he's um, giving us details so that you can't argue against the facts of what happened. Now, I'm not going to go into the one in the storm in the lake, it's in my mind too, but I was just thinking about the feeding of the 5,000. You go to one of the other Gospels and they talk about, you know, we need 200 penny worth of bread to buy enough for all of these people. Well, Philip, I think as it says in John chapter 6, he says that amount of money isn't even enough to begin to feed these people. Besides women and children, 5,000 men besides women and children. And the Lord feeds them all with that amazing miracle with loaves and fishes from his hand as he broke that bread and that fish came all the food that fed all of these people that day. They were hungry. He didn't want them fainting on the way home. He could have, he could have just sent them home. There was plenty of others there to help those that were weak. Those that were that hungry that they might have fainted, somebody could have carried them. But the Lord loved them. Other places we read as he looked upon the crowd, he saw them as sheep not having a shepherd. His heart longed after them. He had a, a love for them that no man has, has ever had. In any similar circumstances with any power to be able to help, perhaps someone with plenty of money or, or wealth to be able to buy all the food that might be needed and the means to be able to go and get it and all the rest of it. The Lord Jesus, he just had a longing after men and women in their need and the need of him and, and, and his ability and his ability to bless even in that practical way was expressed that day as an expression of his love for them as he met them in all of their need. You move on to chapter 8 in John's Gospel. And what do you read about there? You read about a woman that's brought before the Lord Jesus. And her sin is so apparent to everyone as she's brought there in the temple precincts, in the courtyard of the temple, is when the Lord is teaching. And people have flocked to hear him that day. Early in the morning, they're all there because they want to hear what this teacher is going to say. Perhaps they're looking for a miracle. They want to see something happen. The Pharisees think they've got him that day. The law says, this woman needs to be stoned. I can almost see the compassion on the face of the Lord Jesus. This woman stands there trembling, perhaps tears running down her face as she looks down at the ground, feeling the shame of it all. And these Pharisees in their pride bringing this woman before the Lord and saying, the Lord says she should be so stoned, what do you say? And the Lord sees these words. You shouldn't forget two words in what the Lord Jesus said. He that is without sin among you among you. Let him first cast a stone. There was no sin in him. All the sin was among them. His conscience gripped them. The power of God was on display that day by the way that his words went right as an arrow in the heart of these hardened men that were gathered around. And they went out of his presence from the oldest the youngest from the greatest to the least they went out of his presence and the Lord was left standing alone with the woman you know the beautiful thing about this is that the only one that had the right to exercise what was written in the law against that woman that day was the Lord himself he was the one without sin the only one that had the right to judge that day was the Lord Jesus himself that woman and here he is as the light of the world brought before us in that chapter, John chapter 8, which has just exposed the darkness in the men that brought the woman to the temple that day as an example of someone that was a sinner to see what he would do. The Lord's words to her, where are your accusers? Well, there's no man, Lord. They're all gone. And she's wondering what he's going to do now. 
Is he going to read the law to her? He knows that she's standing there feeling the effect of her sin. No, he needs to tell her she's a sinner. He knows that she's standing there condemned that day and she feels that she's in that place. And the Lord says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What words of love for that woman that day. That's what they were. That's what John understood it as. As, as they all in amazement, perhaps, listened to what the disciples, listened to what he said saw how he dealt with people. They would have went home every night or they would have went to, with the Lord to wherever they were staying that night if they weren't close to home. Or perhaps he would have went with them sometimes out to, to in Capernaum to Peter's home. Or perhaps when he was near Bethany, he would have went to Bethany with some of them or whatever. But every night, these men would have been discussing something astounding about what the Lord said the way that he acted in certain situations and permeated through it all was this grace, this love, the love of Jesus being seen to people who so much needed him. The thing was, for those that thought they didn't need him, for them to understand it as well, that would have been a wonderful thing. Like the disciples that were there, oftentimes and perhaps arguing amongst themselves who should be the greatest, they were all his followers. Who, was the, who, was the, who should be the most prominent of them? And the Lord Jesus in his grace dealing with them, bringing a little child before them to show them the spirit and the nature, the kind of pe person that the kingdom of God is full of. Those that are meek and lowly like himself. Those that are gracious like himself. Those that have love for people like himself. True spirituality is in this. Often we fail fail to grasp that. So many Christians perhaps fail to grasp this. It's not in what we know. And to know God is great and to know his word is great and I'm not downplaying learning because it's so important and getting to know our Bibles and what it teaches and so on. But if we miss the most essential thing about it all it should change our characters and mould it like his and make us like him. That's the most important thing. John was learning that lesson. I'm sure he was as he was watching and listening to the Lord Jesus throughout his life. And then you come to John chapter 9 and very often actually you go through John's gospel. The miracles are an illustration of the teaching that's been brought out in between. Teaching by the Lord himself. So when you think of the Lord Jesus as the light of the world, as the one who doesn't have any sin in himself and all the sin is in, in the people that are condemning him, when you come to John chapter 9, you see that illustrated by the man, the blind man that's outside the temple. And they're all questioning, the disciples are questioning after listening to the teaching of the Lord Jesus and the fact that nobody could convict him of sin. And if they, if they die in their sins, the Lord has told them already in previous chapter, where, where he goes, they cannot come. The disciples are listening to all what the, what the Pharisees are saying and what the, the Lord Jesus is saying. And they would have, at the end of, the, of chapter 8, they would have stoned the Lord Jesus for what he said. Far less stoned the woman in the temple if they had had the opportunity as well. But here's the Lord under constraining circumstances coming from the temple. The man perhaps just there outside. And the Lord with that ability and power that he had to just get out of a situation and move away in complete control because that's what he had. He had that power. And he sees this man. And the disciples are questioning us to something to do with sin in his life or whatever that he ended up in this situation or sin in the past, his parents or all the teaching of the Pharisees would be going through their minds about, about the, the, the problem of sin. The Lord says it's not sin that's important in this situation. It's that a work of God could be done even in this man that's sitting there. And the Lord goes on to heal him. And the man comes to understand as well, what, through his experience that day, of his healing by the Lord Jesus and meeting him afterwards, that the Lord Jesus is none other than the Son of God. Who is he, Lord? He asked the Lord. When the Lord asked him if he believes in the Son of God, he says, who is he that I might believe him? And I think the man knew. I think the man knew. <laughs> he just needed to hear it from the Lord. He says, I that speak to you am he. 
and he believed on him. And the Lord Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath day. Here's another expression of love that we can understand. That people that go out their way at their own per personal to their own personal loss or their, of their potential harm, regardless of what other people think about them or might do to them, to help you. They're people that truly care for us. And the Lord Jesus habitually healed people on the Sabbath day. Well, the Sabbath day was the day that people were generally free to go to the temple and they wouldn't be involved in any work. So they came to, to the temple courtyard and around these areas and the Lord had opportunity to teach them. And he taught them on those days and he would be surrounded perhaps sometimes by those that truly needed him because they needed to be healed. And they were in pain in a desperate case, perhaps. And the Lord faced that very often on the Sabbath day and it was a Sabbath day when this man in John chapter 9 was healed by the Lord Jesus. It was one of the reasons why the Pharisees wanted to kill him because he healed on the Sabbath day. The Lord wasn't interested in his own personal protection if it meant that he could bless and heal someone that truly needed him. That's why he said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The purpose of it was to bless men and women. And if he was there with the ability to heal someone, he was going to bless them on the Sabbath day. And the true spirit of the law and what it really meant in its fulfilment was revealed through the Lord Jesus and his love for men and women overshadowing all the rules and regulations that so many had tagged on to the law in the Old Testament, the law of God. And he healed the man, like he healed so many others on the Sabbath day. The man in chapter 5 that's at the pool that I never mentioned, lying there 38 years and the Lord heals him on the Sabbath day. The man didn't even know who he was. He found out afterwards it was Jesus that had healed him. Amazing that, that the Lord never, never told him who he was. And he found the man afterwards. Uh, perhaps he knew he was going to find the man afterwards and let him know who he was. You know, they, they flung them out of the temple. They flung them out of the synagogue. Why? These people that were healed by the Lord Jesus, not only because he, he, they were healed on the Sabbath day or because they carried their bed on the Sabbath day, they were so angry that these people were a testimony to the love of Jesus. Because they didn't care. But he cared. He cared. In chapter 7, and I want you to go back to this, there are men that are sent to take the Lord Jesus, officers from the temple guard. What happened? Well, I, I would like to, I've often thought about this, I would like to kind of paraphrase for you what I think maybe happened. These men go, sent by, the, the, the Pharisees, the scribes in the temple, the Jews, to arrest the Lord Jesus, the chief priests, they sent them. And these officers, these burly men, no doubt, who would be the bodyguards in the, the temple area for these men, they go to take the Lord Jesus and they, they come to where he is because the crowd's gathered. You can't even mistake where the Lord is to be found because the, the crowd of the common, ordinary people are around them. And when they get there, you can see them pushing their way through Everybody's got to make way for these men. They're not, they're not going to be stopped. You don't get in their way. As they're making their way through, perhaps the most prominent man at the front, the leader of them all, the, the, fear, the fearless one, he's right at the front making his way through his baton or whatever it is. And he's planning to arrest the Lord Jesus. And he hears these words from his lips. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he looks into the eyes of the man that he's supposed to arrest. And he hears the words from his mouth and what he's saying. And he sees a genuine, loving expression on his face. And he understands that here is someone that's a teacher in Israel. Someone that's teaching the people like his, his own um, boss might be in the temple <laughs> and he looks into this man's face Jesus Christ and he sees a genuine expression of care and concern with a desire to bless in the way that he's saying it with a longing for men and women to know that blessing 
and he can see it all and he realises the difference between this man and those that have sent him that perhaps were teachers of the people as well and leading the people in a certain direction and he suddenly understands and sees the contrast and his heart is so touched by what the Lord Jesus says that he goes back uh, with his baton perhaps tucked into his sleeve down the side of, of his tunic or his cloak or whatever. And he goes back and he says, well, where, they say, where is he then? Why have you not brought him? And they say, never man spake like this man. What was it? He heard words of love. He heard words that, from a man that genuinely cared, that genuinely had a heart for people, that wanted to bless them above everything else. That was it. His heart was, his heart was taken. He couldn't take the Lord. He himself was taken by the Lord, as it were. As he went, as they went back, him and him and those that followed him, perhaps, perhaps them all had the same impression. Never man spake like this man. That was the Lord Jesus. So you're going through John's Gospel, and you come to John chapter ten, and the Lord Jesus is describing himself as the Good Shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. And he's saying, I'm among you as someone that is willing to lay down my life out of genuine love and care for you. And we were talking earlier about the love of the Father, or the love of God, and the love of the Lord Jesus. And there is no difference. And in that chapter, the Lord Jesus says this amazing thing. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. What I'm understanding from that is this, that the relationship he had with his father in heaven, the one he was going back to that we read of in John chapter 13, that he was going back to his father, the love that his father had for him, the love that the son had for the father, was expressed in their love together for men and women like you and me. The fellowship was complete and completely unbroken between the Son and the Father when the Lord Jesus was upon earth. And he came to fulfil a work which would mean laying down his life and essentially that he might take it again, that you and I might have eternal life. I mean, that's love on display. It surely is. It surely is. That God loved us enough to want to give us eternal life. We read of it in John chapter 3. And here's the love of the Father and the love of the Son being fully expressed in what he was about to do, the Lord Jesus at the cross, when he would lay down his life. And not only that, in taking his life again, because our resurrection and our life, our eternal life, depends on this, that he rose again from the dead. And that's what happened. And he says in that chapter, I've come to give him life. He's come to give us life and give it more, uh, that we might have it more abundantly. Have it to the full, have it to the full. And that eternal life is exactly as it says, it's permanent. No one can pluck them out of his hand, he says. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. My father and I are one. One in aim, one in desire. One. One in the expression of love. The love of God that has been revealed to us through the Lord Jesus. I don't have a lot of time left, but you come to John chapter 11. And I'm just missing out some things, but come to John chapter 11. And there's an amazing verse there that reminds us of the love of the Lord Jesus. He's standing outside the grave of Lazarus and he's shedding tears, he's weeping. Why is he weeping? Because of his love for people. They looked on the Lord and they said, Behold how he loved him. Lazarus, the man that was dead, in the grave, the Lord is standing there. Behold how he loved him. Now you go back further in that chapter and there's another amazing verse that John brings before us. He says, he says after the Lord gets the message that he, the one that he loved was sick, Lazarus, John then tells us, he tells us that the Lord, now he says, the Lord loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. And then it says he waited two, two more days in the place that he was before he responded to the message to go as they thought he would go right away to come across and heal Lazarus before he even died. 
Why does John tell us that he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus? Just in case you might get the idea that the reason he waited an extra two days was because there was some lack in his love. Just in case you thought this was out of kilter, this was out of character with everything else that the Lord Jesus had done in other circumstances when it's when he would respond to the need right away. No, John says, there was absolutely no lack of love in the Lord Jesus for these people. Everybody was in no doubt that he loved them. And when you get to the grave and you see the way that he acted, you knew exa know exactly that he loved them. But there was something wonderful going to happen that day. The glory of God was going to be revealed and Lazarus raised from the dead. And that's exactly what he did. And you know, the message that comes across in 1 John from John, the writer of the gospel, and throughout his gospel is this as well, as a message of light and love and life. Now I don't have time to go into this, but you go to First John and you read there that John says this is the message that we heard from him, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he goes into chapter 3 and he says, this is the message we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What's he talking about? The beginning of our experience with the Lord Jesus. We knew this by listening to him and watching him, that we should love one another, because he was love. And in John in 1 John chapter 2, what does he tell us? This is the promise, same word, message. This is the promise that he's given us. Even eternal life, eternal life. Come to John chapter 13. Having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. I've already mentioned perhaps earlier that another translation says that he showed them the full extent of his love. Loved them to the end. He then showed them, and when he took that water that day and washed the disciples' feet, read it in John chapter 13. That was a full expression to them of his servant character on earth. But not only that, he did it because he loved these men. It wasn't just because he had to that day to teach them a lesson. The Lord never did things just for those reasons, just so that other people would be taught a lesson. There was a genuineness about them. And he took their feet in his hands, the very Son of God, the light of the world, the Word that became flesh, the Messiah of Israel. And these men, with embarrassment on their faces, had their feet washed by the Lord Jesus himself. What an illustration of his servant character, of his love for men and women, and how low he was willing to come. But there's something greater than that. Something greater. He loved them unto the end. And this is a beautiful thing about the life of the Lord Jesus, that that love never diminished right to the very end. And even before his cross, when he was hanging on the cross, it never ended. Thinking of his mother at the cross and his need of her and so on. And the thief that hung beside him on the cross that cried out in his need. And the Lord hearing him in all his pain and his agony. And taking him to paradise that very day after the man had died. Beautiful, the love of Christ. And then John says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's looking back. And he's thinking about him loving his own to the end. And he's thinking about his cross and him laying down his life. At that place where it would seem it was the end for him. It would seem it was, for, was the end. We're so glad it wasn't. But that was the fullest expression of the love of Jesus. That's why Paul says he couldn't get over it. No Christian should be able to get over it. The Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And what does it mean when John says, the disciple whom Jesus loved? I think what he's really saying is, in my life as a disciple, for three years with Jesus Christ, the thing that defined my life throughout all of those years was that I was with someone who truly loved me. Who truly loved me. 
the defining thing about his life was that Jesus loved him. More than anything else, more than anything that he did, more than anything, more than the great disciple that he came. You read his, his first John and so on. What is he interested in? That we should love one another. Why? Because he learned it from the master himself, the Lord Jesus. And when he's thinking back about that time and what he's going to call himself when he doesn't want to give his name, he could have said, I'm the son of Zebedee, or one of the sons of Zebedee. You know, I was a fisherman that Jesus called. No, 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 no. Perhaps John understood it and appreciated it a bit more than the other disciples. That's possible at that moment he did. But he was a disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved. What are you? If you're not saved, if you don't know anything about it, you're the sinner that Jesus loves, that Jesus loves. And he died for on a cross. What about me? I'm the Christian that Jesus loved. I'd love to be a better disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. For every one of us, if this defines us and we understand it and we know it and we appreciate it, it'll mould our characters. It'll make us better, better men and women for God if we understand it fully, that we are the person. We are the person. We are that man, that woman who Jesus loves. Thank you.